speak to you today about change your world by taking an initiative. Change your world by taking an initiative. Now, every time we're coming to speaking about initiatives, actions, and works, there will be Christians who, who kind of struggle with that, and they might say, you know what, that we're not saved by works. We're not saved by actions or initiatives. And that's actually a very good remark, because any Christian need to be very, very familiar with the place for works and the place of grace in our lives, amen? And to just illustrate that and remind you, um, let's just, let's just do, do it this way. Let's, let's pretend that my timeline, my time here on earth would be like ahead of me right here. This is a timeline of my life and existence. And this table would represent the place where I gave my heart to Jesus, okay? So for me, that would have been at 16 years of age. So this time of my life, which would be pre-salvation, in this time, my works are worth absolutely nothing. Absolutely nothing. Now, of course, it, it makes a difference if I'm a good person. It would help my society. It would be a good thing for the people around me. But I'm talking about in my relationship to God. I cannot do anything over here to earn salvation, to earn uh, favor, and to earn affirmation from God. Over here, my righteousness are like dirty rags. There's nothing I can do to improve my position before God. And then I come here, praise God. And God saves me. And by grace through faith, he turns me into a new creation. Not by my works, not by my actions, not by my initiatives, but by his grace alone, received only by faith. Amen? But then I move on. So over here, post-salvation, still my actions, my works, and my initiatives will not make me more acceptable before God. And this is the beautiful difference between our faith in our God and every other religion in the world. Because every other religion will strive to be affirmed by God. But praise God, God has already affirmed us in Christ Jesus. I'm so happy that God the Father did not affirm Jesus at the end of his ministry when he had done all the preaching and all the healing and all the raising from the dead. He affirms Jesus at the time of his baptism. He hasn't preached one single sermon yet. Not healed one single sick pe person. And still God says, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Not because you did good, but because you are my son. And the same thing with you. You are not affirmed for having done well. You are affirmed for being a daughter and a son of the living God. Only through Christ. But still, as we move on, all of a sudden the works has another function. They are there to proclaim the kingdom of God. To preach the message, the gospel of Jesus. And, and James writes in James 2, verse 18, show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by my deeds. So the deeds, the works, the initiatives will never save you. They don't have saving power, but they have power to reflect and show the kingdom of God. Amen? So that's what we're talking about, just to bring that into perspective. First truth that I want to speak a little bit about and address is the fact that God's power is always released by small human initiatives. God's power is always released through small human initiatives. And the, the greatest example in the Bible, if you ask me, uh, would be Exodus chapter 14 and the story about the parting of the Red Sea. Now, the whole setting here of this story, if you go to Exodus chapter 14 in your Bible or your version app or whatever, uh, we come into a situation where the children of Israel have finally been released from the captivity in Egypt, and now they're on their way back home to the promised land. And everything is great until they come across una problema mayor. <laughs> in the shape of a big sea. 
that is right in between them and the promise of God, the promised land on the other side. And things get worse because back in Egypt, Pharaoh changed his mind and he sends the army of Egypt back after the Israelites to capture them, recapture them, and have them brought back into captivity. So now the Israelites are trapped between a rock and a hard place. And it says in chapter 14, verse 10, that as Pharaoh approached, the Israelites looked up, and there were the Egyptians marching after them. They were terrified and cried out to the Lord. We drop down to verse 13. Moses, now the leader, wants to bring some, some, uh, some peace and faith into the people. And he says, do not be afraid. Stand firm and you will see the deliverance the Lord will bring you today. The Egyptians you see today, you will never see again. The Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. Hmm. Now he starts out really great. He says, you will never see the Egyptians again and, and, and have faith and, and have courage. But then he ends with this statement saying, the Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. Now what he suggests is that God will take care of this situation and we don't have to do anything at all. We can just sit there and have a nice cup of coffee <laughs> and say, God, call us when you're done. And uh, the Lord responds to this statement in a very special way. Look at that. Verse 15. Then the Lord said to Moses, why are you crying out to me? It's a very odd statement coming from God because God normally likes when we call out to him, right? But there seemed to be something about Moses' perspective that doesn't really sit right with the Lord. Instead, he says, uh, tell the Israelite to move on, raise your staff and stretch out your hand over the sea to divide the water so that the Israelites can go through the sea on dry ground. Meaning that, yes, I am with you. Yes, you cannot do anything about the situation. It needs to be my power and my authority who delivers you. Still, there is something I want you to do. So here we are. There's a big sea in front of Moses. There are three million people. That's six million eyes looking at him. And the solution that God offers is, ta-da! And of course, Moses would have looked at the staff and went, what in the world? As far as I know, staffs cannot divide seats. They're not useful for that. So this is just a staff. It's completely not up for this challenge. But still, God asks him to take whatever is in his hand and lift it up. Just one small, tiny gesture of faith. And that would release the power of God. So, even though Moses is looking at his staff, looking at the sea, looking at the staff, saying, no way this will accomplish for anything. God didn't ask him to do the miracle. God just wants something to ignite the process. A small, tiny step of faith. A small, tiny initiative of faith that God can bless and multiply. And it says, in verse 21, then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and all that night the Lord drove the sea back with a strong east wind and turned it into dry land. Yeah. Church, who drove the sea back? The Lord. The Lord. Moses wasn't the hero of the story. The staff wasn't the hero of the story. The Lord drove the sea back. Still, there was a small part that Moses needed to play Give God an initiative to launch and to release his power of salvation. We take a small step that we cannot take any glory for. But if we don't take that step, if Moses would not have lifted his staff, the power of God would not have been released. So again, this goes to show God's power is released through small human initiatives. When we do our thing, our step, our task, our responsibility, it will not accomplish to anything in itself, but it will be the release point. It will be the igniter of the process of God's power of salvation to be released. Amen? Amen. Oh, man, I, I remember, 
a story that back in Sweden, most theological seminaries are quite liberal. And I heard the story about a theological student sitting on the stairs of his faculty reading the Bible. And he was all excited reading the Bible. He went, praise God, hallelujah, God is amazing. And a professor came by, asked him, why are you so excited? And, and this student said, well, I'm just reading Exodus 14. God divided the sea, the Red Sea, and God's people can walk straight across. Isn't that incredible? Don't we have a, such a great God? And the professor said, well, you know what? Some scholars think that at that point and at that time, the water of the Red Sea was only about five inches deep. So maybe it wasn't that big of a miracle after all. And the student said, oh, then he thought for a while. And then he said, praise God, hallelujah, isn't God amazing? And the professor said, why are you so excited? Well, God was able to drown the entire Egyptian army in water that was only five inches deep. That's incredible. What a mighty God we have. Praise God. So God's power is always released through a small human initiative. The second thing I want to share with you and remind you of is an initiative gives God, gives God something to multiply. Yeah. We serve a multiplying God. But let's do some math here today. If you take one, just the number one, and you multiply that number by one million, it's going to be one million. And that's really the math of faith. We give God something, a small initiative, a small prayer, a small staff that we raise over our Red Sea, and God multiplies that by a million, amen? And he turns out a million. However, if you give God zero, even though he's a multiplying God, Zero multiplied by one million is zero. zero. So if we don't do anything, if we just said the Lord will fight and we're not going to do anything whatsoever, we're not going to pray, we're not going to lift our staff, we're not going to do anything, zero times one million will still always be zero. And that's the problem of so many Christians. Because they're not lifting their staff. They're not praying that prayer. They're not reaching out to that friend sharing Jesus. And then they wonder why they don't see so much of God's power. Lift your staff. Take an initiative. Give, give God a tiny initiative. Even the smallest one will allow his multiplying power to start working in your life. And the end result will be a miracle. Can we say praise God in the house of the Lord? If you brought your Bible again, would you go to 2 Kings chapter 7? And let's read a beautiful example of this principle. In 2 Kings 7, we, come, we read the story about the city of Samaria, where there is a famine due to a siege. The Arameans have been sieging, laying siege of this city for, for a long time now, and there's a desperate famine happening inside the city walls. And outside the city walls were four men, four leprous men. Now, they were not allowed in the city, so they were sitting at the gate outside the city. And we read about them from verse 3. It says, Now there were four men with leprosy at the entrance of the city gate. They said to each other, Why stay here until we die? If we say we go into the city, the famine is there, and we will die. And if we stay here, we will die. So let's go over to the camp of the Arameans and surrender. If they spare us, we live. If they kill us, then we die. <laughs> this must be the most depressing conversation <laughs> in the Bible. Four times these guys are referring to dying. It's just a question of where we're going to die, but we're going to end up dead, you know. And, and, and on our way to death, we have leprosy. You know, there's, there's zero enthusiasm at all. There's no faith whatsoever, maybe just faith the size of a mustard seed. Because at the end of the story, it says, at dusk, they got up. At dusk, they got up and went to the camp of the Arameans. Zero enthusiasm, zero expectation, but at least they got 
up. They took an initiative. They started moving. They weren't happy with just sitting around waiting for death to catch up with them. They went up and they started walking. And look what happens at the rest of verse 5. When they reached the edge of the camp, no one was there. For the Lord had caused the Arameans to hear the sound of chariots and horses and a great army. So that they said to one another, look, the king of Israel has hired the Hittite and the Egyptian kings to attack us. So they got up and fled in the dusk and abandoned their tents and their horses and their donkeys. They left the camp as it was and ran for their lives. What is God doing here? The only thing he's got to work with are four leprous men with a fascination for dying. But they got up and they started moving. And God puts the biggest microphone in heaven just next to their eight feet as they are walking over from the city of Samaria to the enemy camp. And he multiplies the sound of these eight feet by a million. Praise God, even though that initiative that you're taking might seem small and insignificant, put it in the hands of a multiplying God, and there is no limit to what God can do and what God will do, amen? And maybe you're at that position of desperation right now. I don't know your life. I don't know where, where you're at. But I know what? If you get up and start moving, if you lift that staff, if you pray that prayer, put it in the hand of a mighty God, a multiplying God, and there's a miracle on its way for you. Can we rejoice in the house of the Lord? And, you know, I just want to add some faith also to you who think, well, I'm not that kind of person. I'm just not that kind of person. Because uh, and a few years ago, I was sharing the message about taking an initiative and lifting your staff at a youth conference. And one of the young people that heard the story was this guy, it's called Jonathan. And Jonathan was 17 years old at the time, and he was attending a school with about 1,200 students. And Jonathan was the only Christian there which is the situation and the reality of many Swedish young people. And Jonathan was kind of a shy guy, and he wasn't at all like a preacher, super bold kind of person. So he just thought to himself, what can I do? What kind of staff can I lift? What kind of initiative can I take? And somewhere along that message, I had said to him and encouraged him, just do whatever you can. Take whatever you're passionate about. Take an initiative. And Jonathan's big passion in life was baking. That's a bit of an unusual 70-year-old guy, but still he loved baking. So he said, okay, I'm going to take an initiative by baking. And he baked 100, uh, uh, what do you say? Uh, sh okay. Cupcakes, thank you. How did you know that, sister? <laughs> it was, it's true, it was 100 cupcakes. And, um, and he brought them to the school. And he put, up a, put them on a table, put a sign up saying, Jesus loves you, have a cupcake. <laughs> now in Sweden, nobody gives anything away for free. So when the young people approached the table, they were like, what, what did you put in it? <laughs> What's the catch here? No, 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 Jesus loves you, have a cupcake. Initially, he actually thought about putting tracts, like small papers with the story of the gospel inside the cupcakes. And then, then he came to me with that idea, and I said, what if they never realized there was a track in there, and, <laughs> and the track goes down with them? And Jonathan said, well, at least they get the word of God inside them. <laughs> <laughs> but but he, he just kind of stepped away from that idea, but just put up that table, handed out 100 cupcakes. The next week he was back with 200 chocolate chip cookies, freshly baked. Sign up saying, Jesus loves you. Have a chocolate chip cookie. And now everybody starts talking about not just Jonathan, but this Jesus who loves me so much that there are free cookies around. <laughs> and, and the next week, Jonathan was back. Listen to this. He prepared 400 cups of French chocolate mousse. 400 and he handed them all out saying, Jesus love you, loves you, have a cup of chocolate mousse. In three weeks time, he's told me that the whole school was talking about Jesus. 
That's one 17 year old boy lifting his staff, doing whatever he could, although in itself insignificant, and allowing God an opportunity to speak to all these hearts. And he said at the end of that third week, the week with the chocolate mousse cups, then uh, my science teacher came up to me and, and she pulled me aside and she said, Jonathan, how can I get forgiveness for my sins? <laughs> As a teacher asking a 17 year old student, how can I get forgiveness for my sins? And Jonathan shared the gospel with her and then he started to pray and fast for her secretly for the upcoming week. He fasted for seven full days for her salvation. Next week she came up to him again and said, Jonathan, did you pray for me yesterday? And Jonathan could honestly say yes. He has been praying for her and fasted for her salvation. And she said, I could feel it, she said. I was in a big argument with my husband and I was so sad and so depressed, but all of a sudden there was just a sense of peace. And I just had a thought, Jonathan is praying for you now. And she says, please keep praying because it was amazing. <laughs> And when hearing this story, I was just so fascinated. One 17-year-old guy just baking cupcakes, baking a few cookies, getting a few cups of chocolate mousse together. What is that? That is a staff lifted before the Lord. And 1,200 students heard the gospel and heard about Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. My last thing before we pray regarding taking an initiative and changing your world is the fact that with every initiative, your world is changed and you grow in boldness. You grow in boldness. The Moses that lifted his staff and saw the Red Sea part was not the same Moses as a day before. He took an initiative, he saw the miracle working power of God released, and it changed not only the history of the Israeli people, but it changed his heart. And he grew in boldness and grew in passion. A lot of people come to me and ask me, Pastor Joachim, how can I grow in my faith? How can I grow in my relationship with the Lord? This way. Take a new initiative. Go on that mission trip. Share Jesus with that friend that you've never shared Jesus with. Write your very first Facebook post sharing your faith in Jesus Christ with your Facebook friends. Pray that prayer. Take an initiative. A small and seemingly in insignificant initiative will change not only your world, but it will change you. Yeah. It will change your heart. It will change your face. It will change your eyes. And something will rise up in you as you see the gracious multiplying power of God released in those small initiatives that you can do, in those small staffs that you can raise up. Amen? Amen. I read the story about the, the, the heroes of David, the, the warriors of David, and it says in 1 Chronicles 12 that their faces were the faces of lions. Yeah. That's the faces that we need in modern day Christianity. Amen? Yeah. Not the faces of sadness, not the faces of self-pity, but the faces of lions. Yeah. How do you grow face like a lion? This way. Yeah. By taking an initiative, by doing whatever you can, and allowing God to multiply that initiative. Amen? Yeah. I want to share one final story. Can I? Yeah. Yeah. Please say yes. Because yeah. I'm going to do it anyway, so it makes me feel better. So. <laughs> I'm a bit of a history freak myself. I love history and, and all things we can learn from history. And a few years ago, I came across this fascinating story, actually from here, from the US. And we have to rewind back to 1961. That's what a group of students formed themselves and called themselves the Freedom Riders. Yeah. Now the Freedom Riders, I guess many of you would have heard about them, they were part of the civil rights movements. And to complete the timeline, this would have been like six years after Miss Rosa Parks made her statement on a bus in Montgomery, Alabama. Yeah. And two years prior to the march of Was on Washington, when Dr. King gave his I Have a Dream speech. Now, at this time already, segregation was, was deemed unconstitutional. 
So there was no legal right to, to discriminate and separate uh, black people from white people, but still there were areas and cities that didn't care about this, that still had the segregating laws, like for example, black people had to go in the back of the bus and whites were allowed in the front, and there were restrooms and restaurants that were segregated, even though they couldn't really do that, they did so anyway. And this group of young people, most of them between 18 to 29 years, just decided that we're gonna challenge that in Jesus' name. Because according to our Bible, everybody is created equal. And God loves everybody just as much. So we're just gonna do something, even though we're just young people and we seemingly cannot affect the laws of the nation and the, and the long-term traditions of these areas and these cities, we're gonna do whatever we can. At least we're going to do whatever we can and lift up our staff and take an initiative. So these young people started going on intercontinental buses, like your Greyhound buses. And they would sit next to one another, a black young person, a white young person, even though that was really not, not uh, uh, appreciated in these areas, just to make a statement for what is right and just and godly. And every time the bus would stop at a restaurant, they would sit next to one another, a black young person, a white young person, a black young person, and they would have lunch together. Now, of course, the rumors spread about this, and at every stop they came to, there were mobs gathering. The Klan and other people were there with baseball bats and chains, and they beat these young people up time and time and time again. The police stood watching. The hospitals would leave, wouldn't even treat their, their injuries. And, but still, they just kept going. And these buses were, were put on fire. And, and the, the, the freedom riders, the young people, were really exposed to horrible, horrible violence. And when I read about this story, I, I came across one of the leaders and I read about him. His name was Jim Zwerg. And um, actually, I, I was so fascinated by this initiative that I started researching and trying to find him because Zwerg, Z-W, that's an unusual name. So maybe I can get hold of the guy. And I actually did. I got his number and I called him. He's in his 80s now and he lives in New Mexico. And um, I asked him to share from his perspective. And he said, he was only 21 when he started this movement. And he said, to me, it was not just about civil rights. It was a question of faith. I am a Christian. I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. Even though it might seem insignificant to go up and down the, the south in buses, I need to do something. And he did. And it was just amazing to hear him share how this from his perspective, was just a way that he would bring righteousness and, and, the, and his faith into action. And actually, he was, um, he was one of those who were beaten up. And there's a picture of him right here. The right picture is from one of those attacks on one of those bus rides. And the next one, the picture of him lying there, you see how he holds the paper? It's like he hugs the paper with his picture on it because this was the whole point of the Freedom Riders. If we bring racism up to the surface through nonviolence, non-looting, none of that, but just simply expose the nation to what is really going on, then we'll have to have the politicians act and do something. And they did. And they did. The whole news got all the way up to, to President Robert Kennedy. And laws were changed and people were fired and people were moved. And in six months, this group of young people accomplished their goals of bringing down unrighteousness and bringing forth the glory and the righteousness of the Lord. But you know what? When I researched this story and I, I, I went a bit deeper into it, I came across the story about how hundreds of freedom riders were, were arrested in, in Jackson, Mississippi. And then I came across the mugshots from those arrests. Ladies and gentlemen, can you just take a look at these faces? Can you just look into these eyes for a second or two? Does this young, do these young people seem like broken to you? <laughs> do they feel like, oh, sad? No, they were so horrible to us. 
They beat us up, and we try to do the right thing, but they beat us up. Oh, no. They left a nasty comment on my Facebook post. Oh, no, I'm going to be depressed for three years. When I look at these young people, I see the face of lions. I see the face of lions. And I see the spark in their eye that we need to see in the modern day church. Amen. And that spark will only come when you lift your staff and you do whatever you can to share the gospel of Jesus, stand up for righteousness, and allow him to take that little initiative of yours and multiply it by a million for his glory. Amen. So why don't we stand up in the presence of God? I just want to pray a prayer for you. And whatever initiative you can take, and whatever staff that God wants you to raise up right now, I pray for the boldness to do that. And I pray that that staff that you raise, that prayer that you pray, that initiative that God inspires you to take will release the multiplying power of God and that it will change your world, but not only your world, but actually you. And that you will grow in boldness and that God, people will see the face of a lion when they see you. Let's open our hearts. Lift up our hands and just open ourselves for the presence of the Holy Spirit. Father, we thank you that you have called us broken people to build an unbreakable kingdom. And though we might only have a staff in our hands, and when we look out to the Red Sea, it looks so insignificant. It looks so small, but still you ask us, you ask us to lift it to take that small initiative, to pray that prayer, to share Jesus with that friend, to go on that mission trip. And Father, we pray that as we do, your power will be released. Your multiplying power will come into action and we will be able to change our worlds and not only our world, but actually ourselves. As we grow in boldness, and as we give you glory for all the great things you have done. Father, I pray for creativity. I pray for the boldness to take new steps of faith and to share Jesus with this world in an even stronger way in days and weeks to come. This we pray in Jesus' mighty name. And all people said, Amen. Amen. Let's give it up for the Lord Jesus Christ.